The Sea of Galilee Although not a real sea, it has remained named as such due to the staunch traditions, mainly religious which have grown and flourished from around its shores. The first century historian, Flavius Josephus for example, was so impressed by the areas surrounding the Sea of Galilee, he once wrote, quote, One may call this place the ambition of nature. Reporting a thriving fishing industry around the lake, with well over 200 boats regularly working the waters, archaeologists have since discovered only one such fishing vessel, found in 1986. It has been nicknamed the Jesus Boat. According to Christian religion, much of the ministry of Jesus Christ himself actually occurred upon the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and a recent discovery within the waters themselves has continued to perplex specialists within the area astounding all who have been exploring said discovery, and weighs an estimated 60,000 tons according to researchers. An astonishing size, making it much heavier than any of our modern-day warships. Rising nearly 32 feet out of the ancient sea's sediment, it also has a diameter of about 230 feet. Stonehenge, for example, which is an impressive ancient structure in its own right, has an outer stone circle diameter of only half that, First discovered in 2003 using sonar exploration of the southwest portion of the sea, divers have since been down to investigate the presumably ancient structure, writing regarding their finds within the latest issue of International Journal of Nautical Archaeology. Researcher Yitzhak Paz, Antiquities Authority, and Ben Gurion University believes it could date back more than 4,000 years. Quote, the more logical possibility is that it belongs to the 3rd millennium BC, because there are other megalithic phenomena from that time that are found close by, Paz told LiveScience.com in an interview, noting that those sites are associated with fortified settlements. Could it be that this is where the peoples of bet Yura buried and honored their dead? Is this a proverbial city of the dead, or something else entirely? As more research is undertaken, it is only a matter of time before we understand this amazing structure for what it truly once was. We will of course keep you posted. Thanks for watching guys, and until next time, take care. In one of the world's most war-torn areas, there lies what could quite possibly be one of the most important clues in regards to the construction of ancient structures. Just northwest of Aleppo in Syria rest the very ancient ruins of what is known as Ain Dara Temple. Once completely buried in the sand, subsequently overlooked by the modern world, it is now known to be a literal representation of the Temple of Solomon, built at the same time on an artificial base, placed on the highest land in the area. The temple also shared a similar floor plan, entry porch supported by two columns, a main sanctuary divided between an antechamber and a main chamber and an elevated shrine behind a partition. In 1955, the site gained the attention of numerous scholars from across the world when a large basalt lion was accidentally unearthed, subsequently leading to a full excavation in 1980. By 1985, the entire complex was recognized as extremely significant in ancient times as a place of worship. Much of the structure still possesses evidence of its past grandeur, Various reliefs survive that dot the structure, which depict numerous animals. The interior would have been encrusted in hundreds of finely carved reliefs depicting lions, cherubs, mythical creatures, mountain gods, and ornate geometric designs. But what is surely the most interesting of remaining features is that of a pair of giant footprints, placed in alignment with an altar in the center of the temple, as if they were left as an instruction used by beings who would have been around 60 feet tall. Interestingly, no one really knows who built the temple, and it has been a heated debate for many years. Why would a builder of average size decide to create a positional engraving for worship in the scale of a giant? Are these footprints an obvious clue to the size of the original builders of such structures? It would certainly make ancient buildings such as the pyramids a lot easier to explain. A being of 60 feet in height would be immensely strong and clearly capable of carving the stones we are now completely perplexed by, such as the 12-sided stone in Cusco, Peru. Among countless other examples of seemingly impossible architecture, maybe in the future the footprints will become an extremely important artifact in historical understanding. Andara, a site covered in the past, yet for an entirely different reason. 
our experience along this path of discovery, now allowing one a window, a glimpse, into a deeper, more compounding layer of evidential detail. Unraveling a tangled web of lies, weaved over generations of regurgitated fiction. Accompanied by supportive evidence to again reinforce the original instinctual hypothesis created some 10 years ago now. In particular, in regard to who could have, in reality, possibly created these mind-blowing or gargantuan ancient megalithic ruins. Sites we have touched upon or researched in the past, however from a less experienced evidential angle. Thus we feel they are justified a refined revisit. Yet I digress. Ayandara is a claimed Iron Age settlement. Yet what I am about to demonstrate is that not only is this yet another lie, but that the evidence be overwhelming to support this claim. The choice of stone, used in these once exquisitely finished ruins decoration, for example, not only reminiscent of Persepolis, but due to its clearly much greater level of erosion, it would also, as the art would suggest, far predate Persepolis itself. Yet the belief structure, the artistic evolution, and by default, the same civilization responsible for both and indeed the mythological depictions are undeniably linked. Ayandara being located in Syria and claimed as dating as far back as the Iron Age. We have covered the magnificent Lamassu, found within Persepolis within a two-part special previously. This extraordinary, seemingly superhumanly precise stone-carved sanctuary, however, although clearly possessing a more advanced depiction of the same creatures found at an apparent Iron Age basalt site, which is actually geographically over 1500 kilometers away and dated to a completely different era, regardless of academic opinion, share unarguable evidential similarity and due to erosion levels can be correlated with the evolution of the depictions along with the civilization responsible's past yet now lost abilities. From Ayandara to the Lamassu of Persepolis is clearly an artistic evolution of the mythical creatures depicted on the basalt stones claimed as Iron Age within Ayandara. Furthermore, although only a suspiciously tiny portion remains of the basalt floor, a quietly guarded area found at the foot of Cheops upon the Giza Plateau, or more accurately foundation, although only a remnant of what once was probably one of the most significant parts of the ancient ruins themselves, it still holds countless undeniable curious tool marks, each of which clearly made with a tool unarguably tremendously more powerful and capable than that of what academics claim the builders of the pyramids and their constructors wielded, that of copper tools. It all but now seems an insult to one's intelligence. We clearly find Ayandara highly compelling. Many thousands of written fragments of Dead Sea Scrolls have been discovered over the past century. These often represent remnants of larger texts, either damaged via natural causes or human activities, the vast majority only holding a small portion of the original text. However, a small number of them were well preserved subsequently found almost intact, with nearly a dozen of those found within the Qumran caves. Researchers have since pieced together a collection of some 981 different manuscripts, discovered from 1946 to 1956 from 11 caves. The Qumran caves are located about one mile west of the northwest shore of the Dead Sea, from which they derive their name. Yet one scroll in particular has escaped modern translation, this due to its abnormal metallurgy. Made from nearly pure copper, it is said to contain a treasure map, leading anyone who can decipher the text and follow its instructions to a collection of enormous treasures, said to be hidden within the immediate vicinity of its found location. Bronze coins found at the site corroborate the radiocarbon and paleographic dating of the scrolls, indicating that the copper scroll is thousands of years old. This is, however, this issue, 
halting any modern understanding of where the text suggests. The map details features on the land which would have indeed once led anyone to these treasures, yet in the modern day, these features are all but gone. According to the text, some 64 treasure hoards lay scattered across Jerusalem and the Judean desert, and is claimed to have been used to hide the most valuable treasures in the world from invaders, including a huge amount of gold and silver. Found on two rolls of copper on March 14, 1952, at the back of Cave 3 at Qumran, it was the last of 15 scrolls discovered in the cave. The corroded metal could not be unrolled by conventional means, and so the Jordanian government sent it to Manchester University's College of Technology in England for it to be cut into sections, allowing the text to be read. Professor H. Wright Baker cut the sheets into 23 strips in 1956, and it soon became clear that the rolls were part of the same document. The first transcription was made by Joseph Millick, he initially believed that it was not an actual historical account. Later, however, Millick's view changed. He now believes that the scroll was separate from the community, although it was found at Qumran in Cave 3. As a result, he suggested the copper scroll was a separate deposit. Could this copper scroll possibly lead to a collection of 64 unimaginable ancient treasures? Only time will tell. We find the possibility, however, highly compelling.